Thank you again. My name is Kim Hansen. I'm the president with the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. And first of all, I would like to thank our sponsor here today, which is the Mall of America. And in fact, the Mall of America is our Conversation with Kim series sponsor for 2019. Thank, let's give a nice, warm welcome. That's great. Yes, it's, it's such a nice partnership that they have with not only the art scene, but with the business community as well. So we're grateful to have you. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time. I'm going to just jump right in to our, uh, our introductions because we've got um, some fantastic questions and a very interesting panel. And I hope that you all brought some questions as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and get us started here as we're talking about arts and the economic impact right here in the Bloomington and South Metro area. So I'm going to start with Andrea Speck, who is one of our board members. And Andrea is Executive Director and Chief Advancement Officer for Artistry, which is headquartered right here at the other side of the building. And in the theater is where all those lovely Loeffler people <laughs> went. <laughs> and so it's nice to have a community resource like that for the businesses. That's great. <laughs> Uh, and so she is uh, the, um, as I mentioned, the, off the adv chief advancement officer with Artistry, a regionally respected theater and visual arts organization, anchor tenant right here uh, at Civic Plaza. Andrea's nine years at the helm of Artistry. The organization has grown more than 65% and now serves more than 80,000 people a year. Wow. Wow, she says. <laughs> Artistry. <laughs> They have uh, garnered deserved, de deserved attention for the excellence in, in its theater productions and exhibitions, the social impact of its partnerships with the Bloomington Public Schools and many other organizations, and the innovation of initiatives like creative placemaking in the South Loop, a long-term partnership with the city of Bloomington that places artists at the center of the community and with economic development. Before coming to artistry, Andrea worked as a licensed attorney with Dorsey Whitney. Now talk about left brain, right brain. <laughs> this woman is the best exemplar of that I've ever seen. And she clerked for uh, Minnesota Supreme Court, and she spent nine years in marketing, communications, and fundraising, and two Girl Scout councils. She is deeply committed to the community, which I can attest to. And she uh, sits on the boards of the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, as I mentioned, the Bloomington Noon Rotary, and Minnesota Citizens for the Arts. Welcome, Andrea. I would now like to introduce Sheila Smith, and she is the executive director with the Minnesota Citizens for the Arts, MCA, of which Andrea is very connected to. She, um, they strengthen our cultural community by achieving an arts-friendly policy at the Minnesota legislature and in Congress. So you're probably very busy this time of year. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us. Uh, and she produces important research uh, about the arts and cultural community for education, policy making, and advocacy. A well known leader in the nonprofit sector, she, um, Sheila has been a member of the Executive Committee and the Public Policy Cabinet for the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. She led the arts community into the successful 2008 statewide legacy ballot campaign, which created 25 years of dedicated funding for the arts and environment through the Minnesota State Constitutional Amendment. Um, thank you for that work. She served on the board of the 2012 Minnesota United campaign. That's where you look familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? Yeah. <I> <laughs> Yeah, I was on the staff. I was the oh, regional okay. organizing director for the South Metro. Oh, cool. I thank just you. placed that, and thank you. <laughs> thank you for your work. <laughs> and thank you for your leadership. Moment of clarity. Uh, uh, yes, I apologize, everybody, but that has been bugging me since you walked in. <laughs> Did you see the light bulb go off? Nice to see you again, Sheila. Uh, <laughs> That's great. So um, what the, what the, that campaign, Protecting the Rights for All Minnesotans to Marry, and she served on the staff of the Minnesota Senate as well. 
As a national expert in arts advocacy, Smith has been featured a featured speaker at conferences and events around the country, including grant makers in the arts, Americans for the Arts, and the Rural Arts Summit, and has won several national awards for her work, including the Aileen Valkanes Award for American, uh, American Arts and the Sidney R. Yates Award from the Association of Performing Art Presenters. She is a former chair of the State Arts Action League and part of Americans for the Arts. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you. And then we have uh, Alejandro Palinka. Alejandra. Alejandra. <laughs> Alejandra. Excuse me, Alejandra. I was more concerned about how to pronounce her <laughs> shortcut name. Ala. Ali. Ali. Oh my they're God. They're both. Yeah. More they're coffee. Both, both, more bacon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice to have you here Thank today. You. Uh, Alejandra has served as the City of Bloomington's Director of Creative Placemaking since 2016, where she works with the city's partners, uh, Artistry, and Creative Placemaking Commission, and a diverse, a diverse group of stakeholders to identify and implement investments and projects that align with the South Loop Creative Placemaking Plan. Many of you have probably seen her work on display. Previously as Executive Director of the Northeast Minneapolis Arts Association, she was responsible for general management of the organization and regionally acclaimed events such as Art World, and was responsible for general management of the organization and the largest, uh, the largest open studio, Art World, the largest open studio tour in the country. Her prior positions include roles at the Ames Center in Burnsville and, and Intermedia Arts. She is passionate about the community building that she does through the arts and working with local artists. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> and I would like to recognize a couple of elected officials that we have in the room. As, as we're so happy to have Council Member Tim Bussey here. Thank you for supporting us. And we have School Board Member Dick Bergstrom. Thank you so much. Did I miss anyone? Mm -hmm. And Jim Slocum, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> <laughs> you did you did sneak in and not get that bacon. <laughs> well, I'm going to kick it off with some questions here. And I'm going to start simply by asking, why Bloomington? Though there are thriving art scenes in communities of all sizes and types in Minnesota, the quality and breadth of Bloomington's arts offerings makes us distinctive, uh, especially among the suburbs. What's our secret, Andrea and Ali? Thanks, Kim. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see lots of friendly faces in the audience. That makes this more fun and easier. Um, so Bloomington is special. We, of course, all know that. Uh, it's special in lots of ways, and the quality of the arts community and the arts offerings is certainly one of Bloomington's differentiators. I have been here for only a short bit of Bloomington's art history, but that history goes back to really the the kind of founding generation of Bloomington. And I think most, you know, we've got people in the room who know a lot more about Bloomington history than I do, so jump in and correct me if I'm if I you know, missed up here, but Bloomington was largely, I mean, the, the most of the activity to form, you know, the community that is here today was in the 50s, early 50s and, and following decades. And there's a theater here that is now part of our organization that goes back to 1955 in Bloomington. And I've talked with people who were involved in that theater, Bloomington Civic Theater, from the, those very earliest days. And my understanding is that there was a theater before there were sewer connections to the houses of a lot of the people who were involved in that theater. And I just love that because mm -hmm. it shows how central arts have been to the sense of what this community should be from literally, you know, the very beginning of kind of the modern era of Bloomington. Um, that theater, uh, again, formerly Bloomington Civic Theater, now part of Artistry, is one of the oldest theaters in the state of Minnesota that is still operating. I mean, Theater in the Round is often cited as the oldest theater that's still in operation. That was 1953, so Bloomington Civic Theater in 1955. So, I mean, I just would say that going way, way, way back, there's a passion among the residents of Bloomington for the arts as, as an, a key part of the quality of life. I think what has helped carry that passion and leverage that passion is also a longstanding and unusual, if not unique, history of public private partnership that supports the arts mm -hmm. in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. And lots of communities today have 
maybe we can say are now woke to the power uh, of the arts for economic and community development, but Bloomington got that a long time ago. Um, and the evidence of that commitment to using the public sector judiciously to support and spur private activity. Um, there are many examples of that in Bloomington. Uh, probably the first one that comes to mind was the creation of both the organization and the building known as the Bloomington Art Center in 1976. And that grew out of a bicentennial commission. There were many bicentennial commissions throughout the country. Bloomington's was formed and chose to pursue a couple of projects and the creation of the Bloomington Art Center was one of those. So that was really the first time that a facility was dedicated in Bloomington specifically for the arts. Uh, it was really the precursor to this building, you might say, in some ways, at least in spirit. This is much more of a state of the art, you know, beautiful facility that have, ha has allowed the tenant organizations here to flourish. But the, that original Bloomington Art Center in 1976 was a catalyst not only for our organization, but many other organizations that have now grown up to be independent uh, nonprofit arts organizations here in Bloomington. So. The city enabled that to happen by leasing that space to the, again, the organization for a dollar a year or some such consideration, and it made all of the difference. I think lots of people in the room can probably relate to the idea of a room of one's own to do whatever that business is that you need to do. And so for the arts in Bloomington to have a dedicated space in 1976 and then to create that expectation and that appreciation among residents that the arts should have a space of their own and need a space of their own, I think enabled the uh, movement to create the Center for the Arts here today as part of the City Hall. So that history of both space for the arts in Bloomington and then also public support in other ways for the arts, I think is, is what has created this special situation that exists in Bloomington today. And, and I think there are more current examples as well, including the Creative Placemaking Initiative that I think Ollie's going to talk about. So, Yeah, so, you know, with Creative Placemaking, it's a more recent process for the city. Um, you know, several years ago when the South Loop Development Plan was um, underway, our leadership really identified that creative placemaking could be a great investment in terms of assisting some of the goals they had set forth for creating the South Loop into a more walkable, vibrant, um, more urban environment. And so our partnership with Artistry also really set the table there because um, when Andrea saw that in the South Loop plan, she kind of wondered, well, how is that going to happen? And then that's really where the conversation started to spark. And from there, they received an NEA Our Town grant for $100,000 to kick off our creation of our creative placemaking plan, which really, really delved into how are we doing this long term? What's the capacity? How will this be a sustainable effort? And so I really credit, you know, it is in a lot of cases, um, you know, the council and our leadership really saw and acknowledged this power of creative placemaking as an economic force. And also, of course, the societal and the cultural benefits that it has to offer in building community, but also really recognizing that this has a place in South Loop and hopefully uh, the rest of the city as well. And South Loop encompasses two thirds of our development potential here in Bloomington. So what better place to really um, start demonstrating and working with creative placemaking and shifting the paradigm of community development than in that space. And hopefully we can kind of start to trickle throughout the rest of Bloomington as well. I wonder if we should define creative placemaking at this point. I think that be would yeah. be great. Yeah. Let's yeah. define yeah. that, if you can, Alejandra. <laughs> okay, so, well, okay, so it's not a short definition for me because I really like to explain um, what, what it can mean. There are a variety of definitions of creative placemaking out there, um, but really I think of, at the core of it is um, fostering and creating kind of uh, vibrant communities, so shaping or activating or creating places through a creative lens and working with artists. So that could mean working with artists or arts organizations um, and doing all of that while honoring its, that community's existing assets, history, and character. So making this authentic kind of approach to how do we develop communities into these vibrant kind of areas um, and also while engaging with the community in an authentic way. So making sure that the stakeholders of that community are part of and hopefully leading that process and not just uh, spectators to it. So some of the outcomes of creative placemaking as a process 
us could be things like public art, so a mural. But also at the you know central to placemaking is creating equitable gathering places and walkability. So they could also mean things like pocket parks or painted crosswalks or community gardens or even artists um, who activate vacant storefronts of the, as they've done with Made Here on Hennepin. Um, so that's kind of how I explain it. And I think whatever the process, whatever the outcome is, it should be led by what that specific community wants and needs. Thank you for that. I'm proud to be part of Bloomington when I think about the, the things that we're doing that are really outside the box of, of what normal community building has been over the years. So that's great to have you part of this. So since the chamber does represent the business community, share what you're hearing from our business leaders, many of which are in this room, about the economic impact that your programs are having on their businesses, their customers, and their employees. And I think uh, Sheila and uh, Ali could do this, please. Sure. Um, uh, I've been part of research looking into the economic impact of the arts since 2006. Uh, in Minnesota, we've done uh, statewide uh, studies four or five times uh, and regional studies uh, also four or five times. And uh, what's interesting about the topic to me is that it seems so unexpected to um, for-profit businesses that nonprofits might have an economic impact. Uh, but when you think about, think of artistry here, you have this flagship building drawing people here um, all times of day for workshops, classes, theater events, visual arts events. And by the way, I had one of my paintings in the members show here. I, and, I, I believe you won an award, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> a merit, a recognition. Oh, I did. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> forget about that. Yeah. Um, uh, so just let me give my family as an example of how we had an economic impact in Bloomington, although I live in Forest Lake, which is nearly an hour away from here. So my entire family drove down here for the opening of the show. Well, actually, I drove here a couple times uh, because I had to drop off the artwork, too. But we came down for the entire show. Um, before we went in to see the show, of course, we went out to eat to celebrate that somebody in the family finally got something in a show. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, uh, we bought gas while we were in town because uh, we came from so far away. Uh, we came in, we saw the show, and then afterwards uh, we went out and had a drink to continue celebrating the fact that somebody finally got into a show. Um, and so each of these interactions with Bloomington would not have occurred if it weren't for the visual arts show that was going on here in this building. Um, and that's typical of arts events in drawing people from outside of the area into the area to spend money at for-profit businesses while they are interacting with nonprofit activities. And that's kind of the, that seems to be the most interesting topic to economic development folks around the state. Um, I do a lot of uh, speaking and uh, working with economic development groups um, around the state to think about there are so many wonderful nonprofit arts and culture activities going on uh, in our communities across the state. And of course, here you have artistry in this building as the flagship in the community, but there's so many other activities going on too. Um, how do you promote those activities outside of your communities to draw in those extra dollars into town, um, which benefits all the members of the chamber? That's kind of a, a fundamental exchange. But you also have artistry and the associated organizations here and the, um, the other nonprofits that are not in this building, they are paying salaries. They are employing creative workers right here in town. They are paying the light bill. They are uh, purchasing um, programs. So they're spending money at the local printers, spending money with local caterers uh, for uh, great, great events like uh, what happened out in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> um, Which, to be clear, is not an arts event. No, not a. Right. But that event would not have happened but for this here facility. and that money spent yeah. at that caterer if it weren't for this facility's availability right here in town and its usefulness to the for-profit community, but in, fundamentally it's a non-profit mm -hmm. uh, activity. Mm -hmm. And that, that little bit of for-profit rental supports the non-profit work. So you can see these dollars flowing around in the community. And what's great about um, the spending of non-profits it, is it's generally very hyper-local, the spending of a non-profit. So if you have some international corporation uh, um, I'll, I'll give an example of like what happens at like the dome downtown. You have should I call it the dome? It's not the dome anymore, no. is it? <laughs> no. You know how old I am? U.S. Bank Stadium. Yeah. U.S. Bank Stadium. 
a lot of the vendors in there are big national or multinational corporations. So people, you know, buy their hot dogs. There's there's local businesses in there too, which is awesome. But a lot of them are big, these big international. So you put the dollar in and the dollar leaves town, right? But here in Bloomington, every dollar that comes in at Artistry generally stays in the community without supporting other small businesses. So that's, that's another way. Uh, a third way is the individual artist community is made up of a lot of small business entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They may not be so visible because we found through research that very often their studios, their makerspace is in their house. So you don't even see that there's this small business going on. They're making things, they're rehearsing uh, in people's homes or garages or whatever, and then they come out in the community and they sell what they're making, whether it's a, a work of art or they're running a band and they're you know, playing music around town. Here's more dollars flowing around in town uh, from the activities of, of um, artists. What's interesting is that you, as part of Hennepin County, um, we did a study of the economic impact of the arts in Hopkins uh, just last year. And uh, our individual artist data is at the county level, so it applies to you guys too, which is Hennepin County. We found nearly 40,000 full-time and part-time artists and creative workers in Hennepin County. It's by far the largest number of creative workers anywhere in the state, um, really just a mile ahead of everywhere else. Um, this includes just over 15,000 full-time artists and just uh, over 24,000 part-time artists. Um, and what's interesting is the average hourly wage for creative workers in this county is uh, nearly $25.50 per hour. Um, people think of arts occupations as not being paid well. Um, uh, on a statewide perspective, very often you'll find that the artist and creative worker wages are actually higher than the average worker wage because people are drawing dollars into their community from outside of the community. Um, in Hennepin County, that's not true because we have such a huge population of very high paid workers. I mean, all the high, most of the highest paid workers in Minnesota are in Hennepin County, really. Um, uh, it's also, uh, Hennepin County also has the highest density of creative workers. Uh, uh, 6.2% of all jobs are artist or creative worker jobs in this county. Um, and then finally, through, uh, through the surveys that we've done of the artist population here in this county, we found that uh, in terms of what do artists need to make a living and a life uh, as an artist, the number one need is space, appropriate space. So if you're a maker- Back to the rim of one's own? concept. Yes. Yeah. So if you're a maker, you need a dedicated studio space and the tools you need in order to make what you need to make. But then you also need some sort of spaces where you can sell that work. Um, if you're a theater artist or a musician, you need spaces to rehearse and then you need spaces to perform that are appropriate. If you're a dancer, you need, again, rehearsal space and generally a sprung floor for a dancer is um, very, very important so that they don't hurt their legs when they uh, bang onto the floor. Um, so if you look at any of these occupations, this space need is really uh, rising uh, as an interest of munis municipalities across the state. For example, in Hastings, they've just completed um, a live work, artist live workspace in their downtown, and a lot that had been empty and unused for decades is now this lively center of um, artist live workspaces. Hopkins is working on a project for artist live workspaces, part of the reason that they um, worked with us to do an economic impact study. So while I don't have data specific to Bloomington, uh, you can see that the communities around you and like you are very interested in this topic, um, both because of the economic impact of having more and more artists and nonprofits in your area, um, but also because of the rising cons consciousness about the importance of quality of life to um, attracting and retaining people in your community that build up your community over time. And what, what's fun about the passage of the Legacy Amendment, which was um, a statewide referendum to increase the state sales tax by a teeny tiny mm -hmm. fraction, that money being dedicated to land, water, parks, and arts. The dedicated funding for the arts is going into every county in the state. Artistry is supported, mm -hmm. and many of almost all of the nonprofits here in uh, the area are supported mm -hmm. by legacy dollars. Um, as an interesting side note is the Minnesota Citizens for the Arts Board uh, decided to pursue the legacy amendment here in this center not shortly after it was built. I did not know that. At a Minnesota Citizens for the Arts board meeting across the hall, I remember it very clearly, we discussed the ramifications of trying to do something so crazy and audacious, and we decided to go for it <laughs> because we were in this fantastic space. Wow. <laughs> I love it. I love that, too. Yeah. Can I, and I know we're, the handoff was going to be to Alejandro, but oh actually there is some Bloomington-specific yeah. data that I wanted to share. Please. Um, and, you know, these are, well, and, and obviously we're talking about estimates here. I mean, this is a... 
economics is a dismal science and not always a super precise one either. Um, we did some back of the envelope calculations because there is Americans or the, there are Americans for the arts data uh, on the same topics that Sheila is talking about. And the national average expenditure per arts attendee, and this is over and above the admission price they pay to attend the arts event, event is thirty-one dollars and forty-seven cents. Mm -hmm. So if you take, if you apply that to artistry data for 2018 in terms of the number of theater goers and visitors that we have, our estimate of the economic impact of artistry's activity is one million one hundred and thirty-six thousand dollars. So again, for what that's worth, it is back of envelope, but um, that is based on national statistics about the average expenditure, again per arts attendee. And that's, I mean, our budget is two point two million dollars. So um, it's it's really interesting to start looking at the impact of the arts through that lens. So the one point one three six million in economic impact is solely the impact of your audience. Correct. So you add that to your budget to find mm -hmm. your total economic Right. Mm -hmm. True. Because, again, we employ people, artists, employees. We purchase, again, things from vendors, all of those things. So what's your annual budget again? $2.2 million. So that makes your total economic impact $3.336 million. There you go. That's how you Fantastic. do it. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and for... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> no, this is real math. <laughs> no fake news here. No, fake no, honestly, that's how we do the calculations yeah. for the statewide study is we look at each segment separately. Mm -hmm. What's the audience impact? What's the per person spending? What's the total audience? Can calculate that out. And we don't use multipliers. You know, we, we are using actual data. So when we're talking about the economic impact of the nonprofit arts and culture organizations in Minnesota, we're talking about their total budgets with no multipliers. What are they actually spending in the community? And in fact, when you add the audiences to the organizations to the spending of artists, which we've also studied in depth, in total annually, it's $2 billion. For the state. For the state with no multipliers, just direct spending. Yeah. Well, I don't have the actual data to share, but it's more anecdotal in terms of my experience with creative placemaking and, and the businesses there. And I know that we've had various partners throughout the formation of our creative placemaking plan and throughout the formation of different events that we've done there. And they've all been very supportive. Mall of America, um, McGough developers in the areas, hotels, they all absolutely acknowledge that this is going to benefit the entire community. I mean, of th them, of course, but also people that live there and work there, their employees as well. Um, one example I think that just kind of shows that's a testament to this is Town Place Suites and AC Hotel actually privately invested in sculptures on their property um, because they saw our plan and they acknowledged kind of what we were doing and they saw the benefits of it. So they actually decided on their own to invest in these pieces. So I think that that really demonstrates um, how how businesses are really seeing that this is of value to them. And I think, and I know this number doesn't sound great, but we 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 do a business survey of Bloomington every other year. And 40% in our previous survey responded that art in public or private locations would be somewhat or very beneficial to their business. And, you know, 40%, you're like, oh, well, that's not the majority. But for us, when the, it's not the culture in Bloomington to have public art, we don't have a lot of sculptures. Um, I think that's a tremendous number. And we really thought that that was exciting to see that businesses are very interested in pursuing something like that throughout Bloomington, not just even in the South Loop. Um, we also recently did an event called Illuminate South Loop at Bloomington Central Station Park uh, during the Super Bowl, and the Hyatt was really excited to have an event across the street from them that just kind of brought greater awareness to the area that showed people that this was a beautiful park that was for use. Um, Bring, bringing recognition to it. And the developers who have apartments on the other side of the park actually invested in their own promotional video because they saw that, you know, events like this really create this image, really cre contribute to the lifestyle that accompanies, you know, living in an apartment that's close to, to Bloomington Central Station Park and having these kinds of activations. So the private investments, I think, speak volumes in terms of the work that we're doing. Um, and certainly, you know, one of the hotel managers nearby um, in South Loop as well, we've had conversations with them and they've actually asked us, can we do more? Um, they really see that a lot of their uh, hotel guests and their employees, they want a place to walk to, kind of a destination and landmark. So could you do benches? Could you do more sculptures? So we're getting all these requests for things that really will activate the area more and foster more walkability. Well, that's, yeah, go ahead, Andrea. There's, well, one other anecdote. You mentioned hotels. Um, many people in this room know Jim Waldvogel, who's a great community leader and the general manager over at the Hilton Minneapolis Bloomington. 
he approached me one day and said, you know, I have the story for you that might be of interest. I I saw some people in our lobby the other day that I've seen, you know, a couple times during the year. And so I just happened to engage them in conversation and ask what brings them to to the Twin Cities, you know, three to four times a year. It turns out they are subscribers of our season subscribers of artistry. They come here all the way from North Dakota to come to our productions and they stay at his hotel. And it, I tell you, it really oh, wow. made an impression on him for obvious reasons. And so he shared that information with me. Wow. So again, another real world example, um, as Sheila has shared, she came from Forest Lake. We have other patrons who are coming all the way from North Dakota. So, and they are staying here in Bloomington and they are again patronizing hotels and restaurants while they're here. Well, that's fantastic. And that, that was the next question. You both, or you all have actually answered this. Are there any other real world examples of how, you know, when we talk about, you know, economic development and, and Andrea was talking about it not being a, you know, a, a, a kind of a fuzzy science, you know, are there some other real world benefits that are, that the, that the business community and the, and the residents right here in Bloomington are uh, experiencing? Yeah. And I'll start off. So with, um, a recent study that I want to point out, and this is still somewhat tied to economic development, but um, there's a recent study from the Knight Foundation called the Soul of the City Study. Mm -hmm. And what it showed was that cities with the highest levels of attachment actually had the highest levels of GDP growth. And so what drove this attachment? They found three factors that were that most contributed to personal attachment. Um, one was openness and welcomeness. So how welcoming is a city to different people? The second is aesthetics. So the physical spaces, the green spaces, and the third is social offerings. So what does the city have to offer in terms of opportunities for social interaction, volunteerism, and things like that? And these factors actually ranked higher than safety, than the local economy, um, and then education in drivers of personal attachment. So when you think of those three things, arts and culture and creative placemaking certainly, you know, contribute to all three of those facets. So, you know, I think that that's really important to think about it in a more holistic way. And there's also a lot of data and research that's really promising showing how the arts and culture contribute to the to the uh, health of our communities of, and of individuals. So, you know, people that are participating in cultural expression or creative expression or events, um, you know, it's actually contributing to their mental and health well and well-being on all of those facets. Um, another another um, angle is that kids who participate in arts and culture, um, whether it's in school in their own curriculum or in the community, as so happen, happens here in this building, they're they're they get higher SAT scores. They're less likely to drop out because they're more engaged with their school. Um, it reduces um, uh, absenteeism and it reduces. Um, uh, violence uh, amongst when a kid participates in an arts event something that's that I love about the arts is it allows us to stand in other people's shoes and see the world through, through their eyes which is so much about what theater does what visual arts do um, uh, I was I was just reading a study this morning about how when people sing their heart rates heart rate will sync with each other and their emotions will sync with each other singing is something that all cultures do it's a way that we uh, connect with other human beings. And uh, so singing is a way to be more healthy in your community too. So all of these different activities uh, provide benefits to kids that we're only really beginning to understand. So let's put funding back in the schools for the arts, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, all schools in Minnesota are required in the K-12 standards to provide a curriculum uh, in arts education. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that some schools are choosing rather than to meet the curriculum standards to spend those dollars on other things. Mm -hmm. It's not a lack of money. It's a lack of focus and decision making in meeting the standards that they're supposed to. <laughs> no, it's true. And I want to jump People in. People make decisions. Yeah. There's a curriculum standard for all these different topics and they make decisions not to meet the art standards. The decision is made, right? Fortunately, that is not the case in Bloomington. I just want to jump in and, again, with a couple of school board members here and just say how much support there is. Again, going back to the theme of public-private partnership, Bloomington is really progressive in terms of the, the support in the schools for the arts as well, and it's really been fun for us to be part of that. Um, Artistry has a deep and growing partnership with the Bloomington Public Schools, and so, again, it's the, the private sector in terms of our 
being a private nonprofit partnering with the Bloomington Public Schools, but our work is complementary to make sure that the standards are both you know, achieved and then ultimately exceeded. So I'm happy to report that Bloomington is not one of the communities that you're talking about. So, but We're, does not mean we shouldn't be concerned about No, I'm not saying Bloomington is one of those places. It's just yeah. that so often that happens when the decision making is, oh, the arts will be less important. We're not going to meet those right. required state standards. And there's no state apparatus that enforces whether or not the schools are meeting the standards for the art for arts education. Um, that's that's important in budgeting time for all districts throughout. Mm -hmm. Is you know we want to maintain core subjects being taught mm -hmm. by teachers and so on like that. But we've struggled with that for years, and we've always maintained, and our position is that that is vital subject area for the growth of the children mm -hmm. to have that opportunity because that stays with them their whole life. You know. Mm -hmm. Young people, as we've done before and on display, mm -hmm. all the art projects that the elementary schools have is just—it's just fantastic, and they're so proud, mm -hmm. and they want to just continue to do that. So that's mm -hmm. a strong, strong issue. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. We're, we're about to come out with a new study about the availability of arts education in Minnesota school systems. It will look at whether or not uh, schools are meeting the standards. Um, I'm waiting for the data to come from the Department of Education. It's several months late. Uh, at some point, we will have access to the data, and we will post it online, and you'll be able to see um, how schools around the state are doing in terms of meeting the standards. Before we leave the topic of other real-world benefits, mm -hmm. uh, aside from economic development, as we were talking about it before, economic impact. There's an indirect economic impact that I think is worth talking about, and that has to do with the image and the reputation of a community, mm -hmm. for example, within even the Twin Cities metro area. And I've said before that I believe the arts are a differentiator for Bloomington to a degree. I mean, those of you in the room who know me well know that this is a soapbox I've been on um, in my time here at Artistry. Frankly, I think in some ways our our arts, the vitality of our arts community here is under leveraged as a differentiator. We could do a better job collectively of communicating uh, that this does exist in Bloomington and why it's special. And I happen to bring as my prop our media clips book or our clips file. Um, this was just for artistry from 2017 18. The extent of the coverage, of the media coverage mm -hmm. um, that has been garnered by, again, particularly our theater productions, just because there tends to be more coverage uh, in the Twin Cities of theater relative to other art forms. This is free PR. I mean, this is PR for the city of Bloomington. It's not just for artistry. And when people in other regions of the metro, not just people who follow the arts, but I would argue that casual person who's leafing through the variety section, they see this again and again and again. And when they see an organization like Artistry being connected to Bloomington, it starts to raise that idea that there's more going on in Bloomington you know, than just those things that might be top of mind for people. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that does, again, have this impact of a sense of vitality. Huh, maybe I should look again at Bloomington as a place to live, a place to um, send my kids to school. I think that there is, again, it's, it's even fuzzier than the type of economic impact we were talking about earlier, but it's real. Um, the contribution of arts to a sense of, again, a community's vitality and, and as a high quality place to live. We have done quite a bit of surveying of our own patrons, so bear that in mind. I mean, these are our patrons, so they are excited about the arts and they are predisposed to think that they have a positive impact in the community. But it's been really rewarding for us to do this annual surveying of people who have participated in some way or form in artistry's programming over three years, and we've asked them, you know, do, do you think that, uh, that artistry is important or very important to Bloomington's quality of life? 99% of the people we surveyed said that artistry was either important or very important to Bloomington's quality of life. And then this was the question that for me is sort of the holy grail, and it is, you know, to what extent is artistry a source of civic pride for the city of Bloomington? 94% of the people that we surveyed said that artistry was a moderate or significant source of civic pride for the city of Bloomington. And actually the, the group that said it was a significant source of civic pride was 77%. So that's very uh, reinforcing for us to see that. And again, just goes to this point that the arts are something that people do take great pride in. I think they do recognize, particularly in Bloomington, that there is something special here uh, and that 
you know, it's it should not be taken for granted uh, mm -hmm. what we have in this community. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. If you would share that with me, I, I will, will spread it to the world. I will do that. <laughs> I, l I love factoids. Yeah, we actually, more publicity, that would be awesome. This data comes from um, something that we now have done for the second year in a row for 2018 called our Return on Investment Report. We developed it for the city specifically because the city, capital C city, is not only our landlord, but a significant funder, a significant partner. We wanted to encapsulate the impact, the social and economic impact of artistry, essentially as a, a report to our shareholder, a report to our investor in what is the impact of that city support. So I would be happy to share the whole return on investment report with you. Great. I Good. may post it on my website completely. Um, and what's interesting about this polling data is it aligns totally with the public opinion polling that we have access to on a statewide basis that tells, that tells us two things about Minnesotans that I really love. One is that Minnesotans are more likely to attend nonprofit arts and culture events than people in the rest of America. Minnesota has a special relationship with the arts. We are more engaged with and participating in the arts. Um, the last uh, study that we did found over 22 million attendees in Minnesota to nonprofit arts and culture events annually. That would mean that every Minnesotan, because we only have about five and a half million people in Minnesota, is attending a nonprofit arts and culture event about four times a year. Um, the same rate applies also for the kids in Minnesota, and a lot of those participation, a lot of that participation is uh, done for free um, because the Legacy Amendment is funding so much access to the arts, which is exciting. And then secondly, Minnesotans are more likely to be an artist, a singer, a dancer, a photographer, a graphic artist than the people in the rest of America. We are so, it's not just that we're attending, but we're also doing. Um, and that's a great and fertile environment. Uh, for attracting people to Bloomington uh, when you're offering, you've got things to offer here that a lot of other communities don't. And we know that Minnesotans are very interested in these things and wanting to participate in these things, whether it's workshops or being on the stage or getting their work um, exhibited here, as mine was. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's great. That all fits in. Yeah. Did, did we mention that you had a work here? Um, in a, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think we... <laughs> We may have done that. <laughs> so I, I want to open it up to questions in the audience. I do have another question that I can ask, but I do want to open it up because these people are extremely interesting. I, uh, I think this for first 45 minutes has gone very fast because we're learning so much. Please, let's engage with the audience. What do you have, Jim? Um, you can't help but go, when you go into a hospital or a hotel or various other businesses. Or the airport. Mm -hmm. Art Mm -hmm. And um, how do we keep our local artists uh, on that uh, program so that they can be recognized mm -hmm. rather than just bringing them in from the world famous artists, you know, who have copies of all these mm -hmm. people like mm -hmm. Well, there are a couple hotels in, in South Loop, actually, that have worked with local artists themselves. And I know that, you know, even just working with us or being our partners, we did a series of demonstration projects where we connected hosts with artists, so businesses with artists. So I, I'd like to think that, you know, artistry in the city, we can have a role in at least establishing relationships with with businesses and artists. And I think, you know, I think businesses may approach that kind of art side of it as either it's a it's a corporate kind of standard that they have to uh, adhere to or they're not experts so um, certainly I think the role that we can play is just facilitating connections as much as possible introducing artists to businesses yeah if your business has empty walls there are artists in Bloomington who could provide you with beautiful work to display yeah there's a lot who, of partnerships available who would people contact <laughs> have yeah, contact or artistry I, well, as well. I have a. Di I mean, I and I definitely don't mean to be the like the conversation killer here because I, I love I love the question and the the premise there that wouldn't it be great to get more local original art on the walls of our businesses and and other nonprofits? I think what sometimes gets overlooked, and I'll use an analogy might or may not be meaningful to people here, but you know, sometimes there's a reaction when there's a, a challenge in resources to say, well, couldn't you do that with volunteers? Yes, and we could also have more art on the walls of hospitals, you know, local art, and it takes someone to coordinate that, and that typically takes money or time. I mean, it's not, it doesn't just happen. You know, in fact, so at Artistry, to be really frank, um, 
it's a mixed, we have mixed emotions when someone approaches us and says, well, could you help me, you know, or could you be a part of getting art on my walls? We don't have a staff person who right now would be available to spend that time to do that, to do that project because it does take time to do that well. Again, who's going to put out a call for the art? Who's going to, you know, kind of figure out whether that art is suitable for the nature of that business? Who is going to install that? I mean, you see where I'm going. There are just a host of different practical matters that come up. It's a wonderful idea. Um, but like anything, it takes attention, time, yeah. resources. Um, and I think, you know, for us, that's, we've, we've just really had to look at what is our mission. We can't do everything. And so when we are approached, typically in situations like that, I mean, about the best we can do is maybe try to put that, that business person in contact with, uh, again, an artist that we might know is interested in doing yeah. something like that. Well, so. an Art Force is a company in Northeast that I recommend mm -hmm. um, certainly to work with. If you're looking to have that expertise and contract it out and have them help you through that process, they actually specialize in that. And you can tell them that you're looking to work specifically with local artists. So there are organizations and individuals that work with corporate art, and that is their expertise. And so for us, it's more just connecting if you have that call, for example, of Art Force, let's say, hypothetically help you put a, out a call for art and, and that process we can help connect you especially artistry has a really strong connection to artists here in, in Bloomington or the Southwest Metro so that's kind of where I feel like our connection would come in not necessarily the expertise to install or curate or put together that call um, it, it is an investment certainly but I think that you know you can tell by walking into a building that kind of sense of having original art is very different than having those you know large kind of mass produced prints within it you feel the difference so it makes a difference in in the image of your company and your branding and the kind of environment that you want to create so great information what other questions do we have tim sure, a, a couple of questions for you um, so you, you talked about the, the the energy and the life and, and, and all that comes from the creativity and the, and the artists who live uh, in the community is there any evidence or a leap between that creative group and business related creative folks like entrepreneurs or inventors or folks who are willing to take creative chances in the business world. And then the second part, uh, again in your in your research or your knowledge of the state, obviously the arts community in Minnesota was built originally by the, the, the people who built the state, the businesses in the state, willing then to fund the arts in the state. Has that continued with the new as that generation has passed to the next generation, do we see a new generation of, of business owners, Fortune five hundred executives or willing to give it that same level? Well, these are both complicated questions. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll start with the second one. Um, as uh, Minnesota-based companies have become more international and the older generation of founders has passed on and uh, passed on to the new generation or the company is sold to a larger, more international corporation, we are losing the local focus of the, especially the very large corporate community. It's different if the businesses are smaller um, or local, um, but these really, really big companies are gradually losing their local character um, as they get, you know, it's not true of all of them. Target, for example, is a very strong art supporter, um, but it is, they're leaving behind these fantastic um, foundations um, in Minnesota, you know, McKnight from 3M, et cetera. But it is worrisome to see a gradual decay over time of the local investments of these large businesses. Um, for small, for mid-sized and smaller businesses, though, they are local and their focus is local, and they're more likely to be uh, supportive and have a relationship with the local organizations. So, um, it's it's tough because. Um, Nonprofits, by their nature, their their mission is public service. You know, basically, the heart of a mission of a nonprofit is public service. Is what, what, how do they serve the members of their community, um, regardless of the 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 income or or uh, ability of the local community to actually pay for the activities that are offered, and uh, no nonprofit is making from ticket sales what it costs to actually put on the play in the community or pay the light bill for a big facility or whatever it might be. Um, so it has to be supported by philanthropy. Um, and another leg of the stool, of course, is municipal or county support. It's more and more common actually uh, happening over time. 
Uh, so the fact that the very large corporations are slowly stepping back, you know, you see them fall kind of one at a time as they shift their philanthropy focus. Um, and uh, it's tough on the nonprofits because they're not expected to just continue to pr provide the services that they're already providing, but everybody wants them to keep providing more and more services for larger and larger populations at the same time that the large philanthropy is decaying. It's troubling. Unfortunately, and I know there's a second question in their heart of the beast. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know if anybody has heard the public radio coverage over the last 24 hours, but we have yet another arts organization in a, in a past 12 months that's been kind of depressing from an arts landscape standpoint, particularly small to medium-sized, small to mid-sized arts organizations really struggling. Um, in many respects for the reasons that you're talking about. Funders, traditional funders that they could count on for general operating support or project support are unexpectedly pulling funding or shifting their priorities to other things. Yep. yep. Uh, you had a second question. It was about, remind me. Does the artistic creative class make the jump to the business creative class? Well, they're actually not separate. They are a workforce as part of the rest of the workforce. So any particular business is going to have an uh, in-house graphic designer or they're gonna be hiring a, a, a contract graphic, de graphic, graphic designer, just for one example. Um, what's interesting about artist careers these days, it's generally it's not monolithic. Um, people are getting their income streams from multiple places um, and more and more of you know, the gig economy is sort of taking over the rest of the economy. But for individual artists, they may have a gig teaching in a school. They, and in addition to that, they're showing at a particular gallery. They may be selling at art fairs. I'm just thinking of a visual artist uh, as an example. I know a visual artist in Little Falls who drives to Chaska twice a week to teach in the school system because it was the only place she could find for a regular teaching gig. She owns a gallery in Little Falls. She's organizing big art crawls and events in Little Falls to bring more business to town. Um, she also serves on the boards of several nonprofits. I mean, not, uh, individual artists are wearing 20 hats. Um, and it's a really interesting way to make a living and kind of fun. Um, she may also get a for-profit gig with a local business designing their new logo or their new menu or whatever it might be. So they're just taking on all kinds of different jobs, for-profit, non-profit, education, whatever it might be. Um, so I don't see them as different. I just see, I see them as participants in the workforce. Did you have a question? I know your hand was up. Um, I'm interested to see, and I think I read something about this, from a performing arts standpoint, Open Streets is mm. going to be participating. <laughs> there we go. She's <laughs> laughing. Something like a little glimmer, and I'm like, oh, Open Streets. Yeah. Well, you know, Open Streets has worked so well in so many communities in Minneapolis and throughout the Twin Cities. And I think from a you want to define it? Sorry. For, oh, for sure. People who are, yes. What is that? Yeah. Ah. So Open Streets is an event. And really, it's where you close down a main, usually a main artery or a popular street where there's lots of retail and businesses and you close it down for pedestrians. So walkers, bikers, a lot of time, the local nonprofits set up tents. There's activities in the street. So what it does is it completely closes down those streets for activating it so that it's a space realm for kids to ride their bikes skateboard whatever it is that you do so temporarily we temporarily might yeah. yeah it's usually just for one day we're talking about nicollet mall it's something different but. yeah so i know like in northeast example for example they do it on central avenue um so there's a lot of you know businesses um up and down that artery so um and there's an organization <laughs> that would be popular. Uh, yeah. I know there's been conversations there's been in a this lot community of about, yeah, about doing, doing this. It in so this is something that's on the radar. It certainly would be a paradigm shift for us, I think, especially in a suburban context and, and the way that our streets are laid out, the logistics concern with it. It certainly has been a topic that's been discussed, you know, with planning, with planners and engineers and city council. Certainly speak to our council member afterwards of your support of that. Um, so, yeah, there, there definitely has been a lot of conversations. <laughs> Great. Did we have another question here? Yes, Dick. Uh, yes. Um, so bringing it back to local artists. Do you, do we have a definition of what an artist is? So, um, yes, we have I'm six asking, minutes. I'm asking, I'm <laughs> I saw um, uh, an employee at my son's orthodontist, which is here in Bloomington, um, had some, apparently had some extra time and drew this fantastic mural <clears throat> on the wall of the orthodontist office. <clears throat> um, first of all, they were allowed to do that. 
Uh, secondly, they, they were allowed to share their their passion for for art. Clearly, it was it was somebody who had a passion for art, but they may not consider themselves an artist. And so, hey, I just doodle. Mm -hmm. Oh, you should you should publish that. No, I just I just like to mess around. Mm -hmm. But it was the entire wall in the, in the office. Now that's not an individual event. That's not just one person. There are many people in our local community. But how do they know that you're looking for local artists if you if you're only advertising or or publishing where artists who people who consider themselves artists are looking? How do you find the person that just do it? I'm, I'm going to answer this one. Yeah. Okay. So for the purposes of Creative Minnesota, we defined as an, as an artist um, anyone who self-identified themselves as an artist. That's it. In terms of economic impact, though, we are studying in depth only those artists who are making a living full-time or part-time as artists. So there's a wider community of artists. Um, I can actually tell you the percentages of the different types. Uh let me take a quick. While look. you're looking for that, I'm just going to say I, I do. Th I mean, this is a, it's a great question because by Sheila's own definition just now that she shared, that leaves out many people who make things or are engaged. <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know where my voice is going, but engaged in creative pursuits, but don't self-identify as artists. So I do think that that presents an interesting challenge for organizations and specifically in the creative placemaking context where we want to engage quote unquote, not just the usual suspects in community building, and but people who have creative ideas to share, that can be a barrier if we only use the language of artists. And because again, there are a lot of creative people who don't, who don't self-identify that way. But yeah, yes. and a, a lot more people think of, think that uh, creative expression is very important to their lives. But if you ask them they're an artist, they won't say yes. Um, in terms of the the artist population um, that we've studied, those people who self-identify as an artist, 24% work full-time as artists. They are supported entirely through their creative work. 42% are part-time artists, partially supported through their creative work and then having other occupations. 25% are hobby artists. They're very clear. They don't want to make money. They're doing it for fun. And 2% are other, that is, they are student artists or retired. And I think for a creative placemaking, um, you know, what we've tried to do, so I'll, I'll give you an example. One of our recent programs that we call Creative Spark, um, we offered an application to anyone to propose an idea of a way to activate a space or create a project short term or temporary, even long term um, in South Loop. And we provided four stipends to applicants. And so the way that we, we were really careful in framing the application to not just artists like, hey, if you're an artist, apply to this. But really, it was it was crafted towards if you care or live or visit the South Loop, if you have a creative idea, if you have a way that you want to express yourself. So the way that we really framed that application was that you didn't have to identify um, as an artist to apply. And we made the application very simple. We didn't ask for a list of past work that you've done, for example. Um, we really just asked, like, what is your idea and how does it, you know, where, where what does it look like to you? And so the four applicants that we received, um, one of them was actually, they're just resident here in Bloomington and they wanted a cultural festival and so they don't have event experience they don't have you know artistic experience per se but they wanted to work together as a community to organize you know a simple cultural festival to really uh, display and celebrate the diversity that we have here in Bloomington and so we were able to provide them some guidance and a stipend to help just kind of spark this idea um, and then the other three applicants, um, one of them is a mural artist. He's a resident here in Bloomington, but he's actually never done. His name's Rock Martinez. He's never done a mural in Bloomington. Um, he has done murals all throughout the country, but never here in Bloomington. So this really offered him an opportunity to do something he's been wanting to cultivate, which are 3D murals. So really cut out murals to display along the light rail along Bloomington Central Station Park. Um, so even though he did identify as an artist, he'd never seen an opportunity here that 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 worked for him. Um, and then the third we have is is also an artist who wanted to do a temporary kind of a 
shelter of a great horned owl to really um, identify and to, um, to really showcase the diversity of the natural resources that are in South Loop. And she's going to be working with the Wildlife Refuge, which is another tremendous asset in South Loop, on working that. Um, and then the fourth, we have residents, again, so not artists, but residents um, who live in South Loop who wanted to see a musical concert at Bloomington Central Station Park. So now they get to pick the musician, they get to pick the date, they get to pick what's going on there, and we provide them again with just some guidance and the stipend to actually produce that themselves, giving them ownership of the event. So it was great to see that actually half of the people that received it were not artists, but just residents of the community and to empower them to do that. And just a quick, you you had said four applicants. In fact, oh, we had many sorry. applicants. Yes, we had, we had 36, four. I think, applicants. Yeah, and, and, that, and again, I think a lot of those 36 applicants were people who would not necessarily self-identify as artists. So that was exciting because it showed that it's working. You know, this particular approach for for this particular project said we were successful in communicating that it was not just for people who self-identified as artists. So we we'll hopefully see more of that. I saw that. Oh, great. Oh, well, perfect connection. You know, I'm going to, one more question. I know John, a uh, board member here with Artistry, did you have a, a, a quick question? Well, sure, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I, I was sort of triggered in my mind uh, what, what Tim had raised, and, and, and there's a question I had related to, and maybe to you, but when we've got um, projects or architects or developers uh, that are interfacing with the city, do we have a way to um, nudge, support, or the like? I, I'm thinking about, I work for a company, Comcast, that's based in Philadelphia, and one of our challenges is attracting workforce. And so we've got two large buildings in downtown Philadelphia recently constructed, and both of them have as their first floor, if you will, a public space that's uh, an exhibition center and park, and mm -hmm. we've commissioned with some official nonprofit and government uh, help, commissioned some real internationally acclaimed and Pennsylvania-based and Philadelphia-based inspiring artists, and the idea is to inspire the people that work there and to recruit people and to have a gathering space in Don City in downtown Philadelphia, and it, it just strikes me that, huh, hearing what Tim had to say, Allie, do you have a mechanism to really kind of nudge folks in that direction that are prepared to make some investments but to help make, make a exceptional art, if you will, or inspiring art available here that makes this that a place, and maybe there's economic development that comes from that. Right. Yeah, I think the the one thing, so I'm actually nestled within our economic development um, departments, the Port Authority, um, and I'm also on the Development Review Committee, so anytime there's a development or a developer that's coming into the South Loop proposing an idea, I'm able to participate um, on a panel of various departments throughout the city that are reviewing that proposal. Um, I think also just having our South Loop plan and having our creative placemaking plan and a set of standards that we're really asking for developers to keep in mind if they're coming to the South loop, what we're trying to foster in terms of the community there has really helped um, developers take that initiative on themselves. So um, being part of that process and integrating creative placemaking and the thought and the, pro you know, throughout all of that from beginning conversations through the development review, I think has, has helped tremendously. It's also possible to pass a percent for arts ordinance right. in your community that would encourage um, developers to dedicate some money to yeah. And that's artful additions that we to their discuss as we go citywide. Right now, we're we're dedicated solely in the South Loop, and I know the council is very interested in seeing that go throughout all of Bloomington. So, that's something certainly that we we should. Yeah, discuss in, more. in in the honor of time, I do want to ask if you're all available to answer some questions personally from from our guests, if you if you can. I have to be in St. Paul by nine thirty. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Right. Well, certainly, if 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 but you I'm happy, haven't, happy to answer anything by email or um, ask her. She knows everything. I can. Well, that's great. I know how to reach her. That yeah. is mainly what I know. Well, let's give let's give uh, Alejandra, Andrea, and Sheila a big round of applause. This has been a tremendous way to kick off our monthly membership engagement meetings with the chamber. If any of you have a chance to come to a study group session for the city council, you will hear them talking about creating a sense of community in a lot of different ways. And I heard Tim talking about this just on Monday, about how our neighborhoods 
uh, and, and our, our cultural neighborhoods in particular are really looking for that plate, that sense of community. And I think this is a tremendous way that that is going to uh, foster that in addition to some of the other things that the city is looking at doing. So, so thank you very much. I really appreciate you all being here. Thank you again to Mall of America for sponsoring and for all of you being here. Let us know if you have any other questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.